welcome to this session, which I think I'm not neutral, but uh, promise to be a very exciting one. It's called The Legacies of National Socialist Archaeology and Their Impact on Contemporary Prehistoric Research. Our speakers today are based in various countries, Croatia, Greece, Poland, Austria, Germany, and when I count myself in as the one who will draw some general lines in this introduction, the Netherlands. And in an indirect way, we also can include uh, Ukraine. Since 1945, archaeologists and prehistorians working in these seven countries, like elsewhere in Europe, without exception, must have encountered the legacies of National Socialist archaeology, which was a project that, although not centrally organized, and as a result, a rather diffuse phenomenon, aims at unifying archaeology on a racial base like Germanic, Nordic, or Arab. In many European countries between 1939 and 1945, the occupation and repression by German troops and authorities included the development of new monument acts, changes in academic education for archaeologists, the reorganization of museums, and the development of archaeological propaganda in support of National Socialist ideology. Another legacy is the excavation or appropriation of archaeological sites, formerly known as National, by National Socialist archaeologists, and the looting and destruction of archaeological objects on site or in museums. Yet, defining these legacies in a precise way is a complex matter. Before starting our discussion on the legacies of National Socialist archaeology, we must try to define the historical specificities of National Socialist archaeology itself. To say it differently, there is a nexus between the present and the past we have to take into account. Historiography teaches us that since 1945, the ideas on how one can define National Socialist archaeology have changed considerably and constantly. Actually, even from the very beginnings of Hitler's dictatorship in 1943, there have been discussions on the essence of National Socialist archaeology. Some people saw the danger that the discipline would eventually be crushed between mysticism and propaganda, whereas others observed that the main body of German <coughs> prehistoric research is not more taint by bias than it is elsewhere. That's Ray Clark in 1949. After 1945, the opposition between the scientific SS Amen Erbe and the prehistorians were able to work free under the protection of Luther, and the amateurs and pseudoscientific Hans Rosenberg would dominate historic perceptions. It gave those German prehistorians who had been member of the SS a perfect alibi for their past actions and allowed them to continue their work in post war Germany. It was an image that furthermore turned out to fit extremely well in the very dominant theory of totalitarianism, sorry, which explains events in the Third Reich primarily from a top-down perspective. However, in the 1990s, perspectives changed. Historians of archaeology started to see the agency of prehistorians in the Third Reich itself and in occupied Europe. These prehistorians tried to find a place for themselves in a new order, which had much to offer to them such as undertaking excavation beyond the former national borders. SS archaeologists, like those of the Alde Rosenberg, were often convinced national socialists who, at the same time, with their research, managed to keep up to traditional academic standards. As a result, defining legacies became more complex. They more and more entered the realm of morality. In the last decades, a lot of new research has been published, both in Germany and in the formerly occupied countries. We have deepened our knowledge of and insights in relevant biographies, institutions, specific excavations, the use of forced labor, looting, archaeological propaganda, specific ideas and concepts, and more in general, of the entanglement of archaeology with national socialist politics in Germany and occupied Europe. And during those years, I must admit, I'm working in this field since 1995, I more and more started to understand National Socialist Archaeology as an attempt to denationalize the archaeologies of the European nations. We all know that since the early 19th century, 
archaeology strongly contributed to processes of nation building. National socialist archaeology tried to play down these various national contexts by creating a new racial one, often using already existing transnational networks in European archaeology. Today we look at different national or local stories, as we are, for example, doing. Uh, when we look at different national or local stories, as we are doing today, we can discern how national socialist archaeology failed to overturn these national archaeologies that already had a firm base in society since the start of the 19th century. Against this backdrop, Bruce Trigger's conclusions about the nature of national socialist archaeology in his famous History of Archaeological Thought in 1989 um, might be still inspiring, but is also open for fundamental discussion. He concluded, German archaeologists produced only an extremely strident version of the nationalist archaeology that more often sought to defend the interests of smaller or weaker ethnic groups. They did not succeed, as Lubbock has done, in creating a truly imperialistic archaeology based on the vision of what had happened in the past, that would serve the interests of their country by winning widespread support abroad. In my opinion, my opinion German archaeologists did produce a new racial and, in that sense, imperial archaeology. But I do agree with Trigger on the point that they did not gain general support for their ideas in the occupied countries. Archaeological collaboration did happen, but National Socialist archaeology lacked a real hegemonic quality that was able to convince the occupied people that race counted more than the nation. Following Trigger, in recent years, the history of archaeology has increasingly come to be seen as part of global history. There is much to learn from this approach when studying National Socialist archaeology. World War II was, after all, a world or global war. Especially when we use concepts developed by academics who study related fields like empire, war and society, or even decolonization and cold war. We can, for example, use the concept net, of the network conception of empire, in which people, commodities, and ideas travel, or cultural mobilization, or our new understanding of cold war nationalism, or the methodology reading against the grain, which is developed to understand better what is not in the archives, in the colonial archives. So in this case, when you read the colonial archives, you know you learn about the Dutch people in this colonial excavation, but their staff or the support in colonial societies left out. So these new methodologies and concepts open up the complex and multifaceted entanglements between archaeology and society, the hierarchies that were at work, and the role played by violence, epistemic violence. Given these new developments, and given the nexus I just pointed out, our perspectives on legacies of national sources archaeology will continue to change. I'm therefore very happy that today a new generation of archaeologists from many different countries in Europe, including Germany, will be tackling this problem. Maybe we will draw the conclusion that some of the legacies aren't that bad at all, but still, in my opinion, we have to connect them with the evils of fascism and understand them as such. I'm really looking forward to your presentations. Thank you very much.